This is The Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to The Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones, broadcasting from the hill country of Texas, from an Airbnb. That's where I am, guys, an Airbnb. Have you been watching these conventions? I watched the Democrat convention. I'm watching the Republican convention. And what has been exciting to me is that the single, there's one issue that has loomed, that is looming over both parties, over both conventions. And that is the central issue of our age. That is, of course, the issue of abortion. And the Democrat convention, it was the Planned Parenthood convention, right? In the Democrat convention, you had a Jesuit priest close the convention out in prayer. James Martin, the most heterodox priest in America, right? He ends the convention in a prayer, and in that prayer, he prays for the child in the womb. And that shocking act of courage, that, that shocking act of, act of courage, I should say, unraveled everything else about that convention, like pulling on one thread, and the whole thing unraveled. And in the Republican convention, you have a former uh, director of Planned Parenthood, a former director of Planned Parenthood, a former Planned Parenthood employee of the year, Abby Johnson addressed the brutal history of Planned Parenthood the brutality of abortion. And why is abortion the this, this central issue of our age? I know some of you are like, no, it's not. But you're wrong. And the reason some of you don't want to acknowledge it is because it, it touches so close to home and it touches everything. There have been three brutal denials of our founding principle as a nation, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life. The founding principle of our country is anthropology. We're the only country in the world founded on a vision of the human person. The declaration, the declaration principle, which Abraham Lincoln called the golden apple, the work of art, the constitution is just the frame. The work of art is the declaration principle. In fact, the work of art is a vision of man made in the image of God. So the founding principle of our nation is also intimately connected to the founding principle of our civilization. Western civilization was birthed over centuries, really, right? It wasn't, it's not the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. It wasn't Aeneas landing on the shores of Italy. No, it wasn't when the barbarians... Uh, invaded no when, when when was the found when did when was the west founded when the germans came down no the west was founded when the ser- second person of the trinity became man became god and theologians and philosophers tried to grasp what the meaning of jesus christ was the second person of the trinity becoming man tried to grapple with the jewish and christian scriptures what does it mean to be made in the image of god so the incarnation And this idea introduced into the world through the Jewish scriptures that the human person is made in the image of God that spread with Christian missionaries all over Europe in the West birthed Western civilization. So the Democrat Party has a long history, and I don't mean to be political, I'm just going to give you a little history lesson. The Democrat Party has a long history of brutally denying our founding principle, right? Just facts. The first brutal denial of our founding principle was slavery. And the Democrat Party was the party of slavery. Then the second brutal denial of our founding principle, this is just history, just truth, was segregation. The Democrat Party brutally denied, uh, brutally advocated segregation. Brutally, right? Brutally. And... The third denial of our founding principle, again, a vicious, violent, cruel, brutal denial of our founding principle, is abortion. Again, the Democrat Party has been consistently 
the party of abortion, although now we're seeing eruptions of really authentic pro-life voices in the Democrat Party. And I think that's a beautiful thing because the Republicans fought for uh, desegregation for a century from 1864 to 1964, but it wasn't until in the 50s when Democrats started joining with Republicans and then Democrats joined a Republican majority in the House with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and then it was signed by a Democrat president. We saw the first giant leaps in progress for civil rights. So it's beautiful to see the eruption of authentic pro-life voices in the Democrat Party. So we have these conventions with that really centered on abortion. But what is the plan? We have all of the sentiment in this country. We, we, uh, we are a pro-life country. We hear from our young pro-life leaders like Kristen Hawkins, who is our guest today, the founders of Students for Life of America, or not the founder, but sort of the re-founder, uh, re-imagined, she re-imagined, relaunched in the age of new media, Students for Life, that now is, I believe, the most influential student organization in America. She constantly is reminding us that the millennials, Gen Z too, that they are the pro-life generation. Even in Gen X, in every generation, I think there's this um, growing pro-life sentiment. But what is the plan? And so my guest today is an old friend, Kristen Hawkins, who is president of Students for Life of America. And she is going to walk us through a blueprint, a blueprint for a post-Roe world. You know, overturning Roe versus Wade is just the first milestone into a culture of life. Even a human rights amendment to the Constitution would be like the second milestone. There's still a long way to go, even after full legal protection for the child in the womb from the violence of abortion. That's just the beginning. There's still a long way to go to really build a culture of life and a civilization of love in this post-Roe world. And so this is a long introduction. A little too long? Well, we're going to go with Kristen Hawkins, and she's going to walk us through her blueprint. This episode is being brought to you by Movie to Movement, promoting a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Go to our website, movietomovement.com, and check out our new movie, Divided Hearts of America. It will be on pay-per-view in the next month. We'll have a date for you soon but it will be on pay-per-view with Salem Now. You're not going to be able to miss us. So go to Divided Hearts, I'm sorry, go to movietomovement.com, check out our new film, Divided Hearts of America. Now, my interview with Kristen Hawkins from Students for Life of America. Kristen Hawkins, welcome to the Jason Jones Show. Thanks. It's about dang time you invited me on your podcast. It's called Payola. You got to pay to play on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so well, be, you know I'm too cheap to do that. I'll so. be sending you thanks an invoice. For, okay. Yeah, so, thanks for letting me on for free. First of all, you have a podcast. What's the name of your podcast? I should Explicitly know. Explicitly Pro-Life. Um, and folks should subscribe, and we do get a little explicit, but not too much. Right on. Explicitly pro-life. <laughs> I'll never remember that. It should just be the Kristen Hawkins show. I'd remember that. Okay. And no, I don't like to brand things with my name because it's just, I have a little weird thing about people who brand things with their name. But hey, we'll this is the Jason there. Jones show. What are you trying to say? <laughs> what, are, what are you saying? I'm just saying, I just. I, I, I've always been very intentional with Students for Life of America that Students for Life of America is not me. The pro-life generation, this, this, this group of amazing individuals who I, who I serve, they will, they will survive and thrive when I'm no longer here. And I just, I don't know, I get very like weird about, you know, they, I have had people come up to me like, you really need to do more with your brand, Kristen, your, your brand. And it's like, I literally just started a Facebook page like a year ago. Um, and I realize it's smart to do it because, you know, I'm the one, you know, asking people to donate to me all the time and students for life. And so it's good to have my name out there. And so, so supporters and folks know what I'm playing, what I'm thinking or how I'm perceiving something's happening. But I don't know. I just have issues with it because I don't want anyone to ever think that, you know, the work that we do at students for life, you know, are, are 
everything that we're about. It, it's so much more beyond than me. Like, so your podcast students- is a part of Students for Life, a posture. It is a part of Students okay. for Life, yeah. So my I think, podcast is not a part of Moving Maybe movement. somebody else who's explicit could, like, take it over. I'm the, I'm the most explicit person in the office, so I guess uh, – they, that's the why we call it that because no one could believe I could go an hour without cursing. So, but I do really good though. I'm I think I, I, I've cursed on the air a couple of times, but I don't really I don't curse. But the reason I called it the Jason Jones Show is for the exact same reason you don't call yours the Kristen Hawkins Show. This isn't my organization, and I did not want my organization to be held responsible for the things that I say on this show. <laughs> and I knew that I couldn't do a podcast. And yeah. not eventually say something that will embarrass anyone and everyone associated with me. So if it's mm-hmm. the Jason Jones show, it's like, yo, I'm me, right? That's so, right. Can be me. Now you and I, you you founded Students for Life, or did you refound it? You did you found it, or was it? Did it come from Collegians Students for, for Life? Life? Started in the late '70s as an organization. A couple organizations name changes, but they eventually in 2005 changed the name to Students for Life. It was a student entity. So there was a student board, but there never had been staff. I was hired 15 years ago in August of 2006 to launch Students for Life to become the entity that it is today. Well, let me tell you the difference. So when I was in college and I came to Washington, D.C. from Hawaii, and there was a student or a Collegians for Life conference, which that's what it was called before, right? Yes, American Collegians for Life. And I was so excited to go and... There was about 35 students in a table with some lit on the back. I think yeah, George Weigel, I think the first year, George Weigel was our speaker, but he didn't even stand up to address us. He just <laughs> sat there, and I thought, how rude. I was, mm-hmm. I was so mad about it. I'm like, we are the infantry shock troops of the most important movement in the world. All 35 of us. All 35 of us heroes in this room. These are, these are my f- heroes everyone in this room and uh you can't even stand up anyways i just threw george weigel under the bus but then now i go to your events and i feel like i'm at the academy awards it's amazing they're huge you've got that well how many how many students we were sold out this year again we had over three thousand people this year and and this year actually we morphed our conference the students Life conference into something broader for the entire pro-life movement and so uh, we called it the National Pro-Life Summit, and we actually asked several other organizations to co-host it with us. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, Students for Life. It's, it's more than just Students for Life. It's about our entire movement and this generation, this pro-life generation. Well, every young person in the world, you need to go to this. It's, it's absolutely mm-hmm. unbelievable. And every time I go to these, I look at the students with their backpacks and their computers and their, mm-hmm. their Chick-fil-A's, their Chick-fil-A bag sacks. <laughs> And I'm like, which one of these young people is going to be the president, the Supreme Court judge? And, you know, I'm, I've been in the pro-life movement 31 years. And so I meet a lot of young people, and some of them have gone on to become leaders in the movement. One of them was you. I met you. I met you in 2005, I think. And you were a student still, right? 2006. No, I had just started Students for Life. No, we met in, we met in Missouri. You don't remember when we met. No, we were, that was 2006. That was the uh, ballot initiative. Okay, do you remember? <laughs> do you remember I, my you, first? I remember student. a lot about that. Okay, what I do you remember? Students, what I do you remember? I just started students' life. I was told by my board chairman to go to Missouri and to sit in a car with these crazy guys and start campaigning for this ballot initiative. It was really important. And then I had someone who proceeded to lecture me for days and telling me I was going to go to hell because I wasn't Catholic. Who was that? That's horrible. That's not hmm, smart. Maybe the person who names his show after himself. Maybe that podcast guy. And, okay, okay. <laughs> to, but to be fair, do you know why I said that? <laughs> you know why? You, you're Catholic now, by the way, correct? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but you cannot take credit. I for take 100% super- credit. Yeah, 100%. No. Okay, so look, you came across as like a militantly anti-Catholic person. I just, pres- I was, pre- I'm like, this woman, she's, this young girl is really anti-Catholic. I'm going to say to her what so many of them say to me, so many evangelical, you know, they'll say to me, you're not really Christian or whatever. I'm just going to mm-hmm. say what they say to me to her. Now, was I correct in my perception that you were militantly anti-Catholic? You were not correct in that perception. Oh, the wow. only people that okay. would work for me were Catholic for the first two okay. years of students for life. Well, I'm sorry for I telling you. I would say I was very um, ignorant of what Catholics believed for sure. 
um, and I would say I was anti-Catholic. I think it was more of when I grew up and, and where I grew up in West Virginia, um, it was more of a kind of Catholics are more of a joke of, okay, yeah, they're Catholic, but they're kind of seeing, seeing, you know, Catholics Christmas and Easter. Um, don't, they don't know their faith. And if they knew their faith, they wouldn't be Catholic. That, so it's more of a, I think the perception is more of a looking down upon Catholics, not being anti-Catholic, but, um, but yeah, turns out I was the one who didn't know much about my faith. <laughs> when I was militantly anti, I was militantly anti-Catholic, you know, um, growing up. And I just saw them as, I won't even say, I won't perpetuate stereotypes. And then I become <laughs> Catholic and I'm like, wow, a lot of them are true. A lot of those stereotypes about us were true. And I'm like, uh, who, who was it? That, remember Elaine's boyfriend in Seinfeld who becomes Jewish so he can tell Jewish jokes? Do you remember that? Yes. I'm like that. I just became Catholic so I can bash Catholics more efficiently. <laughs> People can't judge well, me. Well, there it. you go. I'm just going to let you keep talking and digging yourself uh, the in the The Jason hole. Jones Show. <laughs> okay. So you, um, so when, when I met you right away, you know, I always, I always look at people. I'm like, oh, they're tourists. I call people in the pro-life movement tourists. Have you ever heard me call mm-hmm. someone that? Yes. Yeah. They come in, they make a lot of noise. They tell everyone what to do, and then they leave. They act like they own the place, then they leave. I knew when I saw you, this young woman is going to be around. And I think I've told you this before, and it's still true. There are not many people in the pro-life movement who are not post-abortive. By in the movement, I mean leadership mm-hmm. uh, that I trust. And that just comes from years and years of experience. I find that people who are post-abortive, I might disagree with them vehemently. vehemently. I might have huge um, disputes with them on uh, certain issues or candidates. But I never feel like they're selling the movement down the river for their own personal interests. Um, but mm-hmm. so many times people who are not post-abortive, I feel uh, their own interest, their ego, the demands of running an organization will take precedence over an authentic commitment to protecting women and children from the violence of abortion. But with you, I've never, I've never doubted you, and you're always coming out with new exciting initiatives. But I think this might be one of your biggest initiatives yet, and that's why I wanted to have you on, even though you're not paying, oh. paying the payola. Um, and that is you have come out with a plan, mm-hmm. a platform, what do you call it? What do you call it? It's a, it's a blueprint. We're calling it a blueprint, a blueprint for your generation, not even your generation anymore. Right. The, the millennials and the Gen well, it's Z. Our generation it's millennial and Gen Z now. And Gen X, what are we going to do? Watch World War II well, movies? You be a, I'll let you be a part of it too. That's good. You're going to watch World Can War II movies, drinking cocoa? blueprint for a poster of America. The idea is, you know, really, I started working on this this spring, but the idea was, you know, we need a forward looking document, something that shows um, what we intend to do now as we lead up in, in, into making abortion illegal and then after. So what are the, the main, the main points? Main points are obviously reverse Roe versus Wade, make sure judges are appointed who, you know, only judges who will vote to reverse Roe versus Wade, pass pro-life laws, and the states are going to challenge Roe, pass legislation to advance, um, uh, you know, a a post-Roe society curtailing abortion industry, promote adoption and foster care reform, um, create incentives for families, local and state social services to promote adoption and foster care, support pregnant and parenting women on college campuses. Um, This is a a big passion project of mine, Students Life. We have an initiative called Pregnant on Campus. We spend a lot of our time. It's actually one of the three stools of our strategic plan. Um, Encourage family-friendly work policies uh, for employment, uh, making sure that no woman ever again has to feel like she has to choose between her education or her career uh, and the life of her child, and then also, you know, defund Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. You know, we, we're never going to we're never going to win as long as we continue as taxpayers to subsidize this. And we're giving Planned Parenthood almost two million dollars today and every single day to end the lives of a little over nine hundred children, three hundred and sixty of whom will be black. And you also have. Yeah. And by the way, that's a very important point. We defund mm-hmm. Planned Parenthood. We end abortion. And it's, it's like the why, what's the difference? People always say the pro-life movement can learn from the NRA. No, no, we can't. I mean, the Second Amendment has an industry behind it. Now, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, 
But it's not mm-hmm. just the sentiment of all of those Americans like me that understand why the founding fathers thought it was important to recognize our right to self-defense uh, from an abusive government in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bill of Rights. That's not what has preserved the Second Amendment. What has preserved the Second Amendment is, you know, there's an industry that also needs the Second Amendment to stick around uh, for their own benefit. So mm-hmm. the, that's why the Second Amendment has been, uh, groups have had much more success electorally than we have had because they have funding from an industry. And even that industry pales, pales in comparison to how much funding the abortion industry receives and then they, can, they throw up politics. So we, we use our, they use our taxpayer money to fund Planned Parenthood. Then Planned Parenthood That's moves right. money around and uses it to support politicians who support more yep. taxpayer funding for abortion. So how we, until- it's Psycho corruption. So yeah, so getting Planned Parenthood out of politics is key to ending abortion, yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. We continue to fund, to fund them. I mean, that was the argument we made at the White House just 18 months ago of you're literally, by not defunding Planned Parenthood, Mr. President, you're literally funding your political opponent. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So that's something we need to do. And you had something in there that I think might, it's your last point. It's, to me, a very important point, but it's also controversial ask your legislators to consider a constitutional amendment to fully address the mistakes of Roe v. Wade. Now, was that, was there a debate in your team on whether or not you should put that in there? No, no. Our team is post Roe oriented. In fact, when I interviewed you folks to join our team, one of the questions I asked them is, you know, how do they envision America looking when, when Roe is no more? What do they think our strategy is going to be? And we've been very upfront and clear. I, I hate when you hear like the argument from, those on the other side who say that, you know, the pro-life movement's lying to you. They're not telling you their full intention. I, I really do a lot to make sure of, no, we are, we are being completely upfront with you with what our intentions are. Um, and, and so that's one of the things we, we talk to our students about is, yes, we want to reverse Roe versus Wade and the decision of abortion back to states, but that is clearly not our end game, right? That's a, a crucial mo- moment. It's a key domino that has to fall. Um, but the ultimate protection will know will be when we have a constitutional amendment, when we have 37, 38 state legislatures and governors who are willing to say, yes, we need to ratify this into the U.S. Constitution and make sure abortion is will always be a thing of the past. And, and if Trump loses and Biden wins, I think overturning Roe will not even be a part of ending abortion. We'll just have to look straight toward a constitutional amendment. Possibly. I mean, you all, I mean, you have cases now in the Supreme Court that they never actually reverse themselves, but they just no longer apply, right? So it's still actually legal to forcibly sterilize human beings because of their race. Um, that was never really overruled. They never reversed themselves. It's just become something so far out of, you know, a, a, our society's conscience that no one would, would think about that today. Um, well, except unless you're Planned Parenthood and, you know, so still subscribe to their founders' beliefs. But um, it, it's not something. So I think that's something we need to think about, too, is maybe reversing Roe won't look like a full reversal. Maybe it's a, you know, what, we're just not going to hear these cases anymore type of situation. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of different scenarios that can come out if, if Joe Biden and, you know, Kamala Harris, you know, the most pro-abortion ticket ever um, um, do succeed and win on Election Day. You know, there's another point I might want to you might want to consider adding. Uh, in 2004, when I was director of Rock for Life, I was speaking at the University of Maryland, and mm-hmm. a, a liberal journalist from a prominent magazine, The Nation, was there, and she she was dis- so disturbed by my speech and the reception by the students was overwhelming support because, as you know, young people are naturally pro life; they have to be indoctrinated <laughs> to be different, and. Um, so she began to follow me around for months and months and months. And, I, and she started calling people, interviewing people. My, she interviewed my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, asking really inappropriate questions. But after months of following me around, I asked her to just have meet me at the Dubliner in D.C. for beers. So she met me at the Dubliner, and she said, Jason, I believe that you're going to end abortion. I think abortion is going to end. I think your movement's going to succeed. 
But if you thought about what are the negative implications of that? Mm-hmm. And so I wanted, I, I thought I, I wanted to think, you know, she, I wanted to be, give her an honest answer. And, and I said, yeah, I think um, we'll have to learn how to love children with disabilities again. When I was a young person, yep. every bus stop had a, a, a kid with a major disability. You know, there was a, every day you went to the store, every neighborhood, every family, it just seemed like children with disabilities were just everywhere, right? And mm-hmm. now you can go, I mean, years. I can go, you can go years without seeing a child with a disability. Growing up, I didn't go a day. And I said, we, we're going to have to figure that out. We're going to have to learn how to love and sacrifice for children with major disabilities. Well, a couple months go by, she sends me the article that she wrote. And it was about her conversion to being pro-life through following me and that she had sent it. And of course they rejected it. And this woman was a socialist. She was lesbian. She had worked for Planned Parenthood, but she said it was that answer that made her see everything more clearly. So that is one thing in a post row world. Do you think that in a post row world, it'll be beautiful again? You know, we'll see all of the diversity of children that we now destroy in the womb. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we've started to see that a little bit. I mean, Jason, I don't know if you saw, like, the Gerber baby last year was a child who had Down syndrome. Even Target, the very liberal left-leaning entity that they are, I think they just kicked out police this yesterday or this weekend for raising funds. Um, for a local charity at their place, but even Target in their um, uh, modeling, the children modeling in their magazines, they're now you know, utilizing models who who have Down syndrome, who are a little different than us. Um, and I think that I think that's actually showing you where it's, the pendulum is shifting, where it's becoming a you know mainstream thing, and it's actually becoming more you know within the progressive community um, to say, no, this is ableism, right? We can't hold ourselves up higher than someone else simply because they have an extra chromosome that we do. Well, that gets to what you have always said, that this is the pro-life generation. Is that Mm -hmm. people, do people tell you they they think that's wrong or you're wishful thinking or it's hyperbole or is it true? I I get a question a lot of folks going, well, is that really true? Do you really believe it? Um, You know, where are your stats for that? We get a lot of questions from reporters on that. And I think, you know, absolutely. I mean, I I encourage folks to come alongside us. Like, come to campus with us. Have conversations with us. Now, will the majority of millennials or Generation Z call themselves pro-life? No, they won't. Um, But they don't know what the label is. And, and so when you have to look at the polling and when you, when you do look at polling and the polling we've done, the polling we've hired, the polling company and the other polls that I've been able to get my hands on where you actually look at the questions that are asked, you'll see that, you know, when you ask young people the question of, do you think abortion should be legal when, and you go into a specific circumstance, overwhelmingly, you will see that they are, they are against abortion. I think the broader problem is, and something that we've been working on, why we the tagline pro-life generation so much is that it's a, I think it's a broader um, more of a brand issue um, really as to why don't they want to associate themselves with the word pro-life and what do they think pro-life is yeah well I'm making a movie with Benjamin Watson you know and he hates the term pro-life it's been so loaded with uh, it mm-hmm. means racism to so many young people I did a, a, a poll not a poll focus group testing with Kellyanne Conway in the early 2000s, where we interviewed affluent white people who identified as pro-choice, the number mm-hmm. one reason they gave for not being pro-life or identifying as pro-life is they did not want people to perceive they were racist. So how the abortion mm-hmm. industry has been so successful, an industry that was founded by eugenicists, and that regardless of the intent of people that are working within the abortion industry today, they are carrying out the eugenics plans of its founders, how they have been able to make our movement, you know, brand smear the content of, of pro-life. It's, it's really amazing. I guess you can do a lot with billion dollars. You can do a lot of brand damage with the billions of dollars. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what makes right now. So exciting though, when you think about it is that you've, you've had this misconception that they've propagated for so long. 
Um, but now the tables have really been turned, right? The racism, the inherent, the systemic racism of Planned Parenthood has been shown. You had 300 employees in June write openly that, you know, yeah, we need to just, you know, disassociate ourselves from Margaret Sanger, our founder. We shouldn't call our build, name our building after her. We need to take down the square in New York City named after her because she was a eugenicist. There was an article this Saturday, I believe, on BuzzFeed where they were talking about, you know, Planned Parenthood current racist business practices where uh, minority employees were reporting that they weren't getting promoted, that they weren't being listened to, and that, you know, this is an organization run by white people, yet, you know, five, five I think a black woman is five times more likely than a white woman to have an abortion, that, you know, over 80% of their abortion facilities are located in minority, walkable, minority neighborhoods, that they have a clear intent. Um, and so and you, you now you have Kanye West even tweeting this out. Um, and so this is becoming mainstream, that Planned Parenthood is a racist entity. And there's a reckoning that's happening. And I think that's what's so important to me. I've been working like, I mean, you know how crazy I work normally. Um, but it's been insane uh, trying to just keep up with the momentum and keep it going. Because in the, the way I was describing it to our team members the other day of, you know, it's it's happening, you know. The train is on the track, and now we just got to push it down there further, and we got to speed it up. Well, or maybe we've just done all the pushing we can. It's the 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 sentiment of respect for the child in the womb. Every Netflix special did these comedians come out against abortion in the most unexpected and soulful mm-hmm. ways. Uh, you know, Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr, comedian after comedian after comedian in, in South Park. And then you look at our own movement. I think a lot of it has to do with social media. The movement drastically mm-hmm. changed with the, the advent of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You, you know, different people could find people who agree with them. But the pro-life movement is so diverse now, it doesn't even make sense to call it diverse. I mean, it's indistinguishable from the rest of society. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we you did this document, the post row blueprint, for example, I had, you know, Teresa, who's a vegan, atheist, board member of Democrats for Life, next to Charlotte Pence, you know, the vice president's daughter. I, I had a diverse group. I have Catholic. I have, you know, Sissy Graham Lynch, uh, Billy Graham's granddaughter signed on. So, I mean, it was uh, what I was so excited about this document was that this was something that conservatives and progressives were able to agree upon. And yes, our policy prescriptions for maybe how to accomplish some of these things, you might have some deep disagreements about how best to do them, but we're united in the, in the principles of this is what we're striving for. I mean, just overall, like, I feel like in so much in politics, if we actually had that understanding that we, oh, we actually are all united, that we want to make sure children have the best and uh, safest neighborhood, then maybe let's talk and debate our different policy prescriptions. Maybe our politics wouldn't be so messed up um, if we all had that. And I think that's what, you know, it, it's hard as a pro-life movement as we move forward in this right now because we are growing so diverse. And there are so many opinions about how best to move forward. And so it's going to be continual, um, something that we're going to have to continually work with of how do we kind of keep everybody united and, and on the key principles while sometimes it's disagreeing on the strategy of the tactics even. Well, that's what I like about your blueprint. It There's a place for everyone to do what it mm-hmm. is that they want to do and what they think yeah. is the most important thing to do and then just do it like a pit bull. You know, I wrote an article I wish everyone in the pro-life movement would read. It's called A Call to Disunity. Did you ever read I that? I love that one. I shared it all over the place. Yeah, just let people be them. We can disagree. If people, you know, Mm -hmm. if we can disagree, honestly, I do think there was a time in the movement where a large segment of the movement was a surrogate of the RNC and groups like Democrats for Life were just lapdogs for the Democrat Party. But now Mm -hmm. I don't see that. I've been really impressed in the past couple of years with the integrity of Democrats for Life. I have seen fewer and fewer. In fact, I would say I don't think there's one major pro-life group anymore that is a lapdog of any political party and yeah i mean there are some there are still some concerns i mean th- th- there's a concern right now of how do we in our c4 4 and our PAC world you know how do we educate voters in the election um and in 
how do we thank the president for standing up for life and being honestly the most anti-abortion president we've ever had and leading the most anti-abortion administration, but at the same time, also calling him into account to do more and to do better. And that was a, you know, I had lots of conversations yesterday with some folks over at the campaign and over at the Republican Party about this. They released like this 50 point plan this weekend, which I agree with most of it. I was excited, except the fact that they left off the greatest human rights and justice that happens every single day from the sinking plan. And, you know, my call to them was like, now, did that plan come out of? Yeah, you know, I saw that. I saw Lila Rose did a tweet. And, and I will tell you, I was frustrated by Lila's tweet. I thought it was imprudent. I think the way you were doing it's the way to go. You know, I did not like Trump. Do you know how anti-Trump I was? I almost died campaigning against Trump. I got exertional rhabdomyolysis in the primary. But my rule has always been from the, the convention to the election, I am silent if I can't be supportive. If there's a candidate, mm-hmm. if there's two candidates and one's not perfect or I disagree with one, but he's better than the other, they're not going to get my endorsement, but I'm not going to throw rocks at them. If I think that they're on my team, I always say it's like a bank. you got to put as much money in the bank as you can so you can take it out later. So from the convention yep. from the convention till the election, if there's someone who's the most pro-life president ever, I think that's when you put money in the bank. Then you go into those meetings at DOJ, uh, state, HHS, you know, all those places where it touches on the issue that's so important to us. And then you start cashing checks. But the bigger, the more money you put in, um, the bigger the checks you can cash. Now, sometimes you put money in a bank and then you go to cash the check and they're like, nah, never mind. And then you don't put money mm-hmm. in that bank anymore. Then you start throwing rocks at them. But I, I think the way we do it is, yes. But but was now, I did not see, was it the campaign or was it the... Um, was it the RNC? It was a campaign. It was a campaign who put it together, and it was a 50-point plan. Um, and I think that's why, you know, it's so frustrating because the, the, the president and his administration have been so pro-life. that it's like, how did you put something in here about protecting our oceans, but you forgot to mention the babies? Um, and, and so I, I'm glad that we were already, you know, we'd already had written this blueprint. We were already planning to release it the next morning, so it was actually – um, amazing timing uh, to say, look, okay, fine, you forgot to put pro-life and you know anti-abortion sediments into your plan, but don't worry, we've already written the plan for you, Mr. President. Just sign on to this plan. I love um, it. And and really trying to push him to sign on to this plan or to retweet or do something uh, to call attention. And really, what I'm, I'm right now focused on is I've got billboards launching across America on Monday. Coalition of Black Pro-Life Groups we've been working with. We we paint. We tried to paint the sidewalks from the streets in Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago got arrested. We'll be yeah, in another tell, city. T- tell the detail. That was awesome. Time. Tell the details about that. <laughs> well, you know, going back to this moment right now that we're in, this moment that we have, that Planned Parenthood's racist past is finally being highlighted. I, I challenged our team. We, we knew that because the city of D.C. had painted their streets, the mayor had painted their streets, Black Lives Matter, and then she allowed protesters without a permit uh, to go onto the street and add to her painting and write equal defund the police. She didn't take it down. It was out for several months. Um, so we wrote the mayor of D.C. and said, well, son, you've opened up the streets for public expression. We, too, would like to add to this important conversation. And we're going to be in front of Planned Parenthood on Saturday, August 1st. And we're going to write Black Preborn Lives Matter. And we're going to we're going to talk about this. And, you know, the mayor wouldn't respond. The, the police officers at the special events unit called us and asked us to please bring temporary paint, which we agreed to do, even though the protesters, uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters, didn't have to do that. We got out there, and at 4 a.m., there were six squad cars waiting for us, and they told us to be tempted to write anything on the ground. We would be arrested. And so, you know, we brought out our sidewalk chalk, being good activists. We always have a backup plan. And yeah, our sidewalk counselors that we work with, actually one of, the, one of the young people that was arrested, Warner, he's a graduate student, he worked for me. Um, Warner actually sidewalk talks every Saturday in front of the Planned Parenthood there in D.C. as a part of his sidewalk counseling um, volunteer work. And so we started sidewalk chalking on the public sidewalk, Black pre war Lives Matter, and two students were arrested. Um, and so, I, you know, we got a lot of attention for it, obviously, in the conservative press, none in CNN or MSNBC, of course for exposing the hypocrisy of the Washington, D.C. mayor. I was flooded with, you know, you've got a good case when you wake up and you've got like 10 emails from different law firms all pledging to to do the federal lawsuit for you for free. 
Um, and so we definitely have a great First Amendment case against the city and the mayor there for clear viewpoint discrimination. Um, but really the point was, it wasn't just to expose hypocrisy. The point was, let's really add to this conversation because of course Black Lives Matter. But let's also talk about how every single day in our country, 360 Black lives are being ended by a government, basically a government funded entity at Planned Parenthood to $2 million. And we're not able to have that discussion. So um, our billboards are going up next week. Um, but I think now, especially with the campaign kind of forgetting to include abortion into their 50 point plan, I think now is the time we push them harder to, you know, thanks Mr. President for defunding Planned Parenthood of 60 million. Um, but there's about 500 plus more left to go and finish the job. And we believe there's a way for them to do it through executive action, not having to wait on Congress. And he should take advantage of it. And this is a great, this is a great opportunity for him. No, I agree. And, you know, you will say about this president, I want to go back to, um, well, first of all, let me address that, the, you guys getting arrested for chalking. The left uh -huh. always pretends to be radical. These kids, they paint their hair, they pierce themselves, and they're so tepid. They only do acts of rebellion that are credentialed by the political leaders and the neoliberal elite. If Google, Facebook, their mayor, Twitter is on board, they're all about it. But as soon as you go against the gods of the city, they, they, they're they chickens. They're your <laughs> kids are, you know, I shouldn't call them kids, young people, young adults, you know, modestly dressed. They don't look radic like radicals, most of them. But they're doing these absolute, they're just radical acts in the face of the ruling elite, in the face of the mayor. And mm -hmm. that takes real courage. And that's what I love about the young people that get active at Students for Life because it is the pro-life generation, but they are literally denying the gods of the city. When they go yep. up there, it's this great act of impiety. And the, the reality is black lives don't matter because we still have structural racism, racism in the society that's expressed in black lives matter, but we can't talk about the targeting of preborn black children. Black lives yeah. matter, but we can't talk about the reality of the violence of black on black crime that's verboten. You can't talk about that. I think that's structural racism. Not being able to address real problems that need solutions is structural racism. And we're being gaslit. The other thing, these global shutdowns, as I predicted in late February, if we followed Italy's lead, would lead to famine. Now from Bangladesh to South Africa, David Beasley from the World Food Program is predicting 250 million people will starve to death this year, and we're already seeing it. And it's heartbreaking. In South Africa, across Africa, really, um, we've had the biggest, it's, it'll be the biggest year of famine since World War II. And the media reports on it, but they reported on B-17 on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. How do you report on the biggest year of famine since World War II and that's not a front page story. If that's not a lack of, do you think if it was the biggest year of famine since World War II and these, these, there were 10,000 Europeans, children dying a week from yeah. famine, that that wouldn't be a news story? Yeah, that's absolutely right. If 200 kids in France and Germany, I'm sorry, 10,000 children starved to death a month in, in Germany, would that be a news story? Would that be on the front page of the New York Times? But we're not allowed to talk about it. So when you write All Black Lives Matter, you're, ex you're actually truly resisting structural racism. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah, it's um, racism is, I mean, even this morning on Twitter, I was on Twitter, and I try not to get on too much. Um, but unfortunately, reporters do check out tw Twitter feeds. But um, even that, it's just, it's something is like, you know, Tim Scott, Senator Scott's speech last night, and the fact that the RNC had three, you know, African American speakers who had were given this national platform. Who I don't know if you watched Senator Scott's speech, but like I was, you know, I was doing my morning routine. I was watching it because I passed out right before he started to speak. I'm like my, I'm like bawling my eyes out while brushing my teeth. I I didn't realize like I was going to get so emotional watching the end of his his presentation. 
But then I go on Twitter, I sit down at my desk, and trending all day has been Uncle Tom. All day long. Yeah, you're going to call Herschel Walker. You're going to call Tim Scott and Herschel Walker Uncle Tom's. By the way, they jumped a shark. Cuomo jumped a shark. These people jumped a shark. It's going to blow up in their face. You know, this this convention, I watched the... I watched it yesterday. Today, I'd be speaking. Um, it's the whole life convention. Yesterday was mm-hmm. anti-war. This Amy Ford, I didn't expect an anti-assisted suicide speech. Mm-hmm. You know, we heard anti-war. We heard a, a, a gay veteran talk about war and, 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 and stood up against war. We had a woman speak out against assisted suicide Abby Johnson is going to speak out against Planned Parenthood and its history of racism. This is the whole life convention. Then you had all these black speakers. I, I, on ABC, they literally cut away from them. They cut away from Charlie Clark. I'm sorry, Charlie Kirk. They, they cut away, you know, anything that didn't fit their narrative, they cut away from. It was unbelievable to me, really. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, Senator Scott is in my documentary, Divided Hearts of America Everywhere Soon, on pay-per-view with Salem Now. So I was really happy to see he just, he did it. He, it was, the, I think it's the best speech of the convention so far. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, I absolutely loved his speech. I thought he did an amazing job. Uh, and I think it was something that I, I hope and pray like every American Every American gets to listen to that. We'll put it in the show notes, so you have to watch it. Also, we're going to put your blueprint in the show notes. Now, I have to get off this podcast because my next conference call, we're putting together a resource page for our new movie, Divided Hearts of America, that we're going to put at the end of the movie. I have an idea I want to run past you. This could be what I call the Holy Spirit Action Plan. What if we, we build a resource page around your plan? And each point of the plan is a click-through link with all the organizations mm-hmm. that do that. Yeah. Do you we like- pretty much already have that built over our pregnant campus site. So it wouldn't take much to repurpose it, for sure. So, yeah, what I, I thought is... I have a standing with you. I've been running these ads. This is a really cool digital work this year of uh, running ads and getting... Well, maybe we can... Particular, but yeah. No, Let we, me we talk to this that. vendor. Maybe we can work with your guy and we can do a partnership. Because what I wanted is I didn't want to favor one pro-life organization over another. I wanted this movie to belong to our movement, all of it. Yeah. And so we were going to do three. We were going to do for women um, who, are, who need help with pregnancy, resource centers. We, we need, we're going to do post-abortive. We were going to do political action. But I like yours better. It's just much more detailed. And we mm-hmm. could uh, maybe it's something we can do together and partner with Heroic Media and some other groups and get a really – Awesome, sharp site. What do you think of that? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Love it. Okay. I love partnership. Now, before I go, though, I want to clear something up with you on the air. Okay, you ready? <laughs> okay. So yeah. I used to MC your events a lot. Uh huh. And then one year I was really sick and I showed up sick, right? And I was almost late and you, I had pneumonia. And you thought I was going to be like, I get up there and I barely have a voice because I'm so sick. And I make a joke to your students, clearly an inappropriate joke, but clearly a joke where I looked at the audience and I said, I said, I know Kristen was worried I was going to be late. And I looked over at you and I said, Kristen, it's not my fault. I I, I just want to let you know. I passed out in the floor drunk in the bathroom with a Dubliner. But before I went in there, I remember telling the bartender to wake me up at 6 (laughs) a.m. Do you remember that? I, rem- I remember the panic of Now, you people tell me that you think I came to your event drunk or hungover. And I'm like, that. she's, no, you said it. You said that you passed out in the bathroom at the dump. No, <laughs> that said. was a joke. Well, you think if I passed out in the bathroom of the Dublin. By the way, I only passed out drunk once in my life, and I was an 18-year-old infantryman, soldier, oh, twice, once in Japan, Yakuza got me drunk. That's a true story for another day. Um, twice in my life. Definitely when, one of them would not have been the March for Life when my children were with me. <laughs> so I just want, 
I want to clear. I want. I want you to know that. Thank okay. you for saying that. You were just almost like because you were sick. Got it. No, I was. I had pneumonia. I was so. No, but that's not the worst part. The Uber driver, or not the Uber driver. This is pre-Uber. You pre -Uber. Have so many uses. Like, this was pre-Uber. No, 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 no. I was so sick, and this was this was great. The taxi cab driver did not like how far it was. He didn't realize how far this event was. It was in Maryland or something. That he pulled over and told me to get out of his cab. He wasn't going that far. So now I'm like in the middle of nowhere trying to get a cab. Like middle of nowhere, somewhere between downtown D.C. and where your conference was. Like literally in the countryside of Maryland or something in those days. It was not like it was in Bethesda for God's sake. <laughs> like some room. But okay, so that's clear. I just want that rumor to right, be that's washed. Fair. You were not drunk. You were just almost late. Um, but wasn't. So yeah. But wasn't. Was oh, on yeah. uh -huh. but was uh -huh. on time. But I, I do, I do know. I, the I apologize. Panic. The panic was real. I remember the panic. The panic was real. So, um, anything else you want to say? How do people go and sign your your uh, sign on to the blueprint? Yeah, go to postroblueprint.com. You can sign on, add your name. Um, we're we're trying to get figure out a way to get more and more names up on there. I got all, like the notable names you'd recognize up on the site right now. Um, I, I originally only asked like younger pro-lifers. And so now the, the, some of the older pro-lifers are angry that I didn't ask them. So I'm like, yeah, you can be a part of the poet gen too and sign on. So anyone, if you're a living, you're part of the poet gen. So you're, you're an totally ageist. I'm going to dox you on Twitter. <laughs> Kristen Hawkins. Not, I just, I just wanted to be very careful. With hey, the you're going to be old too. It wasn't just all older white people on the damn page, you know, like I needed to make sure we had a good diverse coalition uh since it was a pro-life gen blueprint uh, but yeah anyone can sign on you're welcome you can subscribe to my podcast go to explicitly pro-life on itunes and hey, Kristen, spotify and wherever i just want to let you know you're going to be the old white person one day in the pro-life i movement. am the old white person in my organization now i'm 35 and doing this for 15 years i'm repeatedly reminded about how old i am i'm one of the oldest people who works for me now so it's um, it's coming for me. Trust me, I'm acutely aware of it. I you do you know you don't know this because you weren't in the movement yet. There was a time where I was the edgiest part of the movement. <laughs> in the '90s, I was an atheist guy from Hawaii who was wild. Then it was Brian Kemper before me, the tattooed evangelical guy. There was a time where that was it. They would they would trot yep. us out. There was a yep. time where Brian Kemper and Jason Jones were trotted out to say, "Look." We're diverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now we're two now everyone, old white guys. Definitely, everyone's got the time. Now we're two old white guys. <laughs> I have become the stereotype. That's true. You are. You're an old white person now. Oh, I love I love being old. I love being a grandpa. It's amazing. I've won. I have won at life. Once you're a grandparent, it's like, I won. I, I know. Can, I, I can know. drink. I can't wait. You know, my plan is just I want to drink hot tea, eat Nilla wafers, and watch World War II movies. Just that's it, and bird watch. That that sounds like fun. I just bought land in Idaho, so my plan is to retire and, or even not even retire, and get my family to Idaho and stare at Tetons all day long. I saw my the plan. pictures; it was beautiful, and uh, I hope you. You know, you're someone like me who I know you work very hard, and you don't want to do this, you know, and, yeah. and I see that, that it wears on you. And I, I want to thank you for your, your consistent work now for a decade and a half um, to build an organization that I think is the most influential uh, camp, college campus organization in the country. It'll be in history books. There'll be a time when they write about how did we go from cult, uh, a culture that normalized abortion to where it became unthinkable and um, Students for Life will be in that book. So thank you for your commitment and dedication. Let's protect the child in the womb from the violence of abortion so you can go to Idaho and fly fish and I can eat Nilla wafers and watch uh, the yeah, Big Red One on TNT. Sounds good to me. Let's get it done. All right. Kristen Hawkins, I know you're gonna, you got a lot of work to do, so get to work. Aloha. All right, that was my interview with Kristen Hawkins, president of Students for Life. Go to studentsforliveaction.org. Sign up to be a part of the post-row world, the post-row solution. 
and check out the Post Row Blueprint. It's actually postrowblueprint.com. Has its own domain. I'm really glad we got that little I'm really glad we got that little misconception cleared up about why I was almost late, not late, but almost late to MC the Students for Life of America event. This episode of the Jason Jones show has been brought to you by Movie to Movement and Movie to Movement's The Vulnerable People Project. You can go to our websites, movietomovement.com and thegreatcampaign.org to see all of the work that we do. And we're going to have a big interview, I hope, coming up this week or next week with Benjamin Watson, who is the star of our movie, Divided Hearts of America, a film that is going to rock the world. By the way, we need your support. We want to have the biggest advertising campaign possible. And we're a nonprofit. Movie to Movement, the nonprofit, produced this movie that is going to have a big, broad pay-per-view release. You will see it from sports news to Fox News. We've already been on the cover of, we've already been on the Drudge Report. We've been in Hollywood Reporter, bringing our message of life all over. We're going to reach all of America, but we need your help. So go to movietomovement.com and give your best donation today and become a monthly donor while you're at it. We need your support. All right. Until next time, it's the Jason Jones Show. This has been the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Oh,